I'd like to say good evening to everyone and welcome you all to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and a revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. Since that time, we've gone about to establish branch schools throughout the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Syracuse branch was established in 1969. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to the Dean of our Syracuse branch, Dr. Patrick Trevison. In the school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of our Heavenly Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The correct name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh, which has been improperly substituted by Lord. The correct title of the Word or Son is Elohim, which has been improperly substituted by God and the correct name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Joshua, which has been erroneously substituted to read Jesus or Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title. But unlike Lord or God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title that the Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. With some investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia will prove that neither the Hebrew, Greek, nor Latin languages contain any characters or letters that would produce the sound made by this letter J. The letter J didn't come into the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah, therefore making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of the two names of the Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is spirit, and in this pure spirit state, He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is our source, substance, limits, and bounds. We have Yahweh symbolized in his pure spirit state as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We've drawn the cloud all the way around the edges of the chart, and everything on the chart abides within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within this pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim, the Word or Son, a super incorporeal being. That is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form appears in divine visions and is understood in divine revelations. Later on, the self-same spirit manifests in a fleshly body and walks the earth plain as Joshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. Therefore, the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plain? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of a Holy Name Bible. Also in the school, we teach by a divine pattern of the universe. It's called a divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness of Sinai, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him this tabernacle pattern in a vision. He instructed Moses to build one exactly as he had seen it in the wilderness. It consisted of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments making up the one tabernacle pattern. Now also in this school we go about to show proof how that everything is made 
and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and how that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now in the school we have 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and he actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, creed, sex, nationality, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called power latent in man. Did I read that right? Yes. Yes. Okay, sorry. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, both modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known from the beginning that Yahweh ordained there is no other name given among man whereby man can be saved saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is to speak the truth. And this evening we'll have the lecture dedicated with a prayer by Dr. Jen Miller. That will be followed by our scripture, which is Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, 16 through 28. And that will be read by Dr. Deb Cometti and Dr. Scott Miller. And then we'll have guest acknowledgments by Dr. Tracy Bennett. Good evening, class. Let us all take a moment to bow our hearts and our minds and to thank Yahshua for bringing us down to this little, not so glamorous building so that he can show us the true beauty of his secrets that not all the world is allowed to see. Uh, let's ask him to keep our minds clear and open to what is being taught from the floor. And with that, let us all say. Tonight's scripture will be read out of the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trena of the Scripture Research Association. Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, verses 16 through 28. Moreover, the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a woman in her separation. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed through the countries. According to their way and according to their doings I judged them. And when they entered unto the nations whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of Yahweh, and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith Yahweh, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, 
which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the nations, which ye have profaned profaned in the midst of them, and the nations shall know that I am Yahweh, saith Yahweh, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your Elohim. That's Ezekiel 16, or chapter 36, uh, verses 16 through 28. Good evening, class. I would like to welcome all of you tonight to learn more of Yahweh's eternal purpose, pattern, and plan. Um, we have a returning guest tonight, Daryl Benedict. I'd like to welcome Daryl back with us. And we have a, a visitor from our Ithaca, New York class, Dr. Greg Prestis. Greg, it's always a pleasure to see you and to see all of my brethren. Um, it's always a pleasure when we get together to learn the truth of our Creator and his creation. So sit back and enjoy yourselves. Um, we have no first time guests, so you can proceed as we normally would. So uh, enjoy class, thank you. And for our first speaker, I'd like to introduce Doc, uh, the Dean of our Syracuse branch, Dr. Patrick Trevison. Evening. This isn't such a glamorous building. <laughs> but look at this glamorous cast of characters. <laughs> that we have in the building. Uh, my purpose in getting up here first is to lay a foundation. And it's not always easy to be the first speaker because usually when you sit there you get stimulated and that's when you like to get up and because that's when you like to get rolling. But We'll start reading in the beginning of the scripture reading, and um, we could very easily spend two hours just on this scripture reading. But that's not my purpose. So I'm just going to glance over this and explain why we're reading from where we're reading. Go ahead. Ezekiel 36 and 16. Moreover, the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying... Now, the word came to him, first of all. See, all these things require explanation. Now, the word was not the Bible floating down to him. That's not the word. Those are the words of the word. Mm -hmm. The word is this shape and form of Yahweh, right here. Yahweh having taken on shape and form. Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son of Yahweh. And he appeared to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai, to all the prophets. You understand? And this is the one that is appearing to Ezekiel. And he's telling Ezekiel, what to write in this book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel's not sitting down and, th and saying, well, let me, let me, I wonder what I'll write today. Ezekiel's got nothing to do with it. It's the Holy Spirit that's writing these words. Go ahead. Son of man, when the house of Israel 
Israel dwelled in their own land. They defiled it by their own way and by their doing. Now, when Israel came up out of Egypt, they spent 40 years in the wilderness of Sinai, and then they went through the Jordan River and into Canaan land, and that was considered their own land. And when they went up there, they were warned not to do certain things. And some of those things, and I'm going, I'm glancing over this now. Some of those things were not to worship other gods. And not to work, not to marry other women from other from pagan tribes. And not to get involved in any of this other worship. But to be true to, to Yahweh their Elohim. And to love him with their whole heart and their whole mind and their whole soul. You understand? That's what they were supposed to do. That's all he required of them. So when they went up here, that's what he wanted them to do. But what he's saying is they didn't do that. Is that what it said? Yeah. Go ahead. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. So various times he, he, he takes them into captivity and then they cry out and he brings them back and then they do the same thing again and he sends them into captivity and they cry out and he brings them back. He was very long suffering with them, very patient with them for a very long time until he had enough. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and read. And I scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed in the countries according to their way and according to their doings I judged them. And when they entered unto the heathen whither they went they profaned my holy name. Now when they, gathered, when they went into these heathen and there were there were tribes up there, the Hittites, the, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites. The, there were all these tribes up there. Those are the heathens that he's talking about, the Canaanite tribes. And they had been cursed ever since way back. Um, um, they were the offspring of Ham. And so they were warned not to partake of the habits of these people. But they didn't listen. Go ahead. When they said to them, These are the people of Yahweh and are gone forth out of his land. So they knew these people worshiped Yahweh. And when they went in there and acted the way they did, what they did was they profaned his holy name. Do you understand? Yeah. They're saying, I'm a Yahwist. And then they're going and worshiping the god Moloch by doing that to profaning Yahweh's name. And really, the reality is they're committing adultery, spiritual adultery. That's a whole other lecture. Go ahead and read. Verse 21, But I have pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel has profaned among the heathen whither they went. Now, he had pity for Israel. No. Oh, what did it say? For his holy name. He had pity for his holy name's sake. Right. Oh, what difference does a name make? You can call him whatever you want. Well, that's true, you can, but he might not have pity on that name. Mm -hmm. Now, he had pity for his holy name, and his holy name was Yahweh. And you can do some research and you'll find that that's the accurate, true, original name of your creator. Right. It's Yahweh Elohim. You can come up with any other name you want to, but see, it's up to you to do some research on this on your own and to check it for yourself not to believe what I say but to know it for yourself to verify it to get the facts you can google it you can go into encyclopedias you can find out the veracity of this go ahead therefore say unto the house of Israel 
Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, I do not this for your sakes, O house of God. I'm not doing this for your sake. But for my holy name's sake. But for my holy name's sake. Which Read. you have profaned among the heathen, Be whether you want. Because you profaned it. Read. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am Yahweh. Save Yahweh Yahweh. He's going to sanctify his great name. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Read. When I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Right in public. That's where he's going to be sanctified. Right in public. Just like he is this very night. Read. For I will take you from among the heathen. I will take you from among the heathen. Now listen, this is what he did when you came into class here. Every one of us had a first time here. And we all came from the heathens. And he took us from them. <laughs> Trissy's laughing back there. Except for Trissy. Trissy did. <laughs> he took us all from among the heathens. All of us. From all over. And from all different tribes. Go ahead and read. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. We came from all kinds of countries. Frank came from a country. I'm still trying to figure out where that was. <laughs> we all came from a different country. You understand? And he doesn't mean necessarily Italy or England. He means a spiritual place. Go ahead and read. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. Now he's going to sprinkle clean water upon you. And listen, he's not talking about physical water. He's not talking about a physical water baptism here. He's talking about clean water or the gospel or the truth. And that's what it requires to clean you up inside. You need to be cleaned up inside. The truth will clean up your concepts, your opinions, your theories, and get rid of them and replace them with the truth. And look, he said, I'm the way, the Truth. truth and the life. So when your nonsense is replaced with the truth, it's replaced with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know what's right and what's not. Go ahead. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. Now, He's going to give us a new heart. And that doesn't mean you're going to have a physical heart transplant. You're getting a spiritual heart transplant. Because your heart and your soul, they're synonymous. Your heart, your soul has to be changed. Your soul has to be cleansed. Your soul has to be converted. That's a heart transplant, spiritually speaking. Read. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. A new spirit will I put within you. The spirit you had in you, that had to go. There's a new one that's being put in you. Read. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. The stony heart out of your flesh. See, we're just telling you we're glancing over these things because we could go in the law and the prophets and, and pick out the, the quotes for all these things and sh show you the validity of all this. But go ahead and read. And I will give you a heart of flesh. I will give you, a, in other words, a, a, a living heart, a warm heart, a soft heart. Read. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. Look, I will cause you 
to walk in my statutes. It's not anything you're doing. It's not anything you're doing of your volition. Well, I'm going to be good today. No, it's not about that. He's causing you to walk in his statutes. That's what my book reads. Is that what your book reads? Yep. Continue. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people. And that's not a physical land. That's not physical Israel over there. It's the body of Yahshua. It's the Messiah's body. It's his assembly. That's that's the land he's talking about now. The land exists up here. It's not a physical place. You can be in heaven right up here sitting in your chair. You can be in his kingdom sitting here right here in this unglamorous room. <laughs> Just like that. Just that fast. Now, um, what I would like to do, I would like to go over to Jeremiah 31 and 31, please. Yahweh. Now he's saying, Behold, the days come. Read. And I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And he's saying Israel and Judah because Solomon, after his death, his sons Rehoboam and Jeroboam split the kingdom into Judah and Israel. Okay? So they were split. And they didn't get along with one another. They originally were all one kingdom, Israel. Now they're not. They're divided. Sound familiar? Read. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Now, now, this is important. It's not. We read over these words like this. It's not. Not K-N-O-T, like a knothead. <laughs> but not. This new covenant I'm going to make with them, it's not going to be like the covenant that I made with them when I brought them out of Egypt, right? And into the wilderness of Sinai. He made a covenant with them back here. And they were given this tabernacle. Moses had a vision of it up on the top of Mount Sinai and was told to come down here and build it exactly as he had seen it in the mount. And there were ways of worship in this tabernacle where they had sacrifices. They had water immersions. They had oil. They had lamps that were lit. They had bread. They had incense. And then Yahweh Elohim dwelt on the Ark of the Covenant. And it was threefold. One, two, three. Most holy place, holy place, part round about. And it's, the reason for that is it's showing you because you're spirit, soul, and body. More importantly, it's showing the Godhead, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim and Yahshua. 
And everything is threefold. Everything is composed of an atom, of atoms. Atoms are what? Threefold. threefold. Proton, neutron, electron. There's no getting away from it. Everything is threefold. Now everything in here was a physical way of worship. And this Old Testament or Old Covenant, it was for a carnal mind, it was physical, it was earthly, and it was temporary. And there were physical water baptisms, there were suppers, there were ceremonies in that, in here, in the tabernacle, and then later in the temple when it was constructed. There were circumcisions. There were sacrifices. There was a Ten Commandment law. There were 300 and, and what? 600 and what? How many? 613. 613 commandments or, 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 or ordinances. ordinances all together, right. including the Ten. Right. And they could not keep them. So had, they were constantly coming up here with lambs and such to sacrifice because the innocent animal took their guilt away so that they didn't have to die. You see, it was a way, he gave them a way out, a way of escape. He's always done that. Now, it was all physical water immersions, and, and this was all physical ways of worship, physical rites, physical rituals. Now, he said, read that again in, in Jeremiah for me, Deb. Not according to the covenant. Not. This new one, that he said he was going to make a new one, right? And that it was not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. That I made with, this is their fathers back here. Read. In the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. In the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Which my covenant they broke. Because they broke that covenant. They continually broke that covenant. Read. Although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. He was a husband unto them. He Look, there was a marriage that took place here. He was a husband to them. And they were supposed to be his wife. And Moses was up there 40 days and 40 nights. And they already built the golden calf or were worshiping another god. Or already, already went after another man. So Moses comes down and throws the heart, breaking it, right or wrong? Because he's angry, but really in principle what it's showing is he's, Yahweh's heart was broken by Israel. Because they did not keep his covenants. The bride committed adultery on him or broke his heart. And she just kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it. That's why he's making a new one. And this time, it's not, not going to be like the old one. Read. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward part. Look, this time... It's not going to be outward. It's going to be inward. Is that what it said? Yes. It's going to put it inside them. Read. And write it in their 
heart. It went right, right in their heart or their soul. Read. And will be their Elohim. And I'll be their Elohim. And they shall be my people. And they shall be my people. And that, that's good because that's all I really have time for. My point being, this new covenant, it's not going to be like the old covenant. Now, I would like you to get for me uh, quickly, please, uh, Luke 24 and 27 and 44. Now, who was this, Scott? This is Yahshua. This is the Messiah. This is the Messiah. Now, he's beginning at Moses. He's beginning at Moses and, and, all the, prophets. and the prophets. So, he's beginning at Moses who wrote the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets, which are the next 34 books. Read. All the prophets he expounded unto them, all, he, all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Those are the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Not 1 Corinthians. Not the book of Luke. That's the scriptures. The law and the prophets. And the Messiah, when he taught his disciples, he taught them from the law and the prophets. That's where he had said, and beginning at Moses and the prophets, that's where he went back to. And he taught them. Now go back, to, go to the 44th verse. In verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses. Now everything's got to be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the prophets, and the Psalms, and in the Psalms, concerning me. Concerning me, those things are written there about him, about him. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Now we're going to just take a quick example. In this tabernacle, when they put that lamb on that altar, you have a principle of a death. Mm -hmm. And the lamb had to be placed in here in this laver, and the priests had to cleanse themselves in here, and there's a principle of a burial. And there was uh, uh, this holy anointing oil that was poured on the priest so he did not make errors in here, which was a principle of a resurrection. So you have a death, a burial, and a resurrection, which is dictated by the principles in this pattern right here, this tabernacle pattern, which has been overlooked by the religious world. Really overlooked. Now, since the Messiah thought it was important to go to the Law and the Prophets, we'll go to the Law and the Prophets because we want to do it the way the Messiah did it. And this is the way Paul did it. This is the way the Apostles did it when they went around and taught. So I think we're in pretty good company. Now, you see, you have a tabernacle here before the beginning of all these events. See, first of all, back here in the, you have a, a death with the cre in the beginning of the creation, and you have a burial, it's buried in water, and then you have on the third day, you have the resurrection of the plants, right or wrong. Death, burial, resurrection on the third. And then with Adam, he's placed, you see, uh, uh, he was made of the dust of the earth. And, and 
You could pick up principles all, all over the place down here. He was buried in the mist. See, he's laid there. He's made from the dust of the earth in, in a death-like state. He's buried in a, a mist. You understand? And he's resurrected into the garden. Then he's placed back down here again. And he's put in a death-like state. And the woman is buried in his side. And she's resurrected out of his side. There's another death. A burial. A resurrection. Uh, here with Noah. There's a... The vision is given to Noah. And there's a death of the whole world. And there's a burial by water. And there's a resurrection of that ark into a brand new creation. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff because I'm trying to move along here now, okay? Joseph is put down here in the prison, down here in Egypt. And there's a, he's in a death-like state because you got put in prison down there. They weren't coming in there and saying... Look, you're eligible for parole in a couple of weeks. Uh, what do you look? That didn't happen back there. These guys were worse than Frank and Scott back here <laughs> in these prisons. They were terrible. They, they were in a death-like state. They were buried down there. They didn't have light bulbs in their cells. I mean, nothing. It was like a thousand midnights, death, burial, and. Pharaoh finds out that he can interpret his dream and he's resurrected and he becomes the second most powerful man in Egypt. Death, burial, resurrection. And then you have with Israel, you have the last plague is the plague of death and the blood had to be placed on the door. Four points, just like the four points of blood on the cross there. And Israel is doing this, but they're not doing it in Egypt. So that the death angel would pass, what? Over them. Leave them alone. Not touch their firstborn. And then they're buried in the Red Sea. And it's a three-day journey to and through the wilderness. It's a death, burial, resurrection on the third. They went from captivity for 430 years and they were up here and what did they do when they got through their Red Sea? They sang, they sang a song of victory. They were singing. Singing. They went from a death-like state to singing and dancing. Would you say that a change had taken place? Do you see that? So all we did was take these principles from this pattern right here and we're applying them to the law and to the prophets just like the Messiah did when he taught them back there. Right or wrong? So the same thing with David and Goliath here. Same thing with Daniel in the lion's den. Same thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace here. Jonah, when he's cast overboard, the sailors say, well, he's dead. That's a raging, that Mediterranean, that's like an ocean. It's giant. When a storm comes up on that sea, that's like, it's like a storm in the Atlantic Ocean. You understand? And they said, those sailors, they think he's a goner. And that fish just comes up and just grabs him. He's buried in that fish. And he cries, for, it says in your book, from what? The depths of the belly of hell. Right. And then he's Spewed out after how many days? Three. 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 Death, burial, resurrection on the third. And look at it. The sun is coming up early in the morning. And look, I went through that blazing fast just to show that it's all pointing to the Messiah. Why he's got to die. Why he's got to be buried. And why he's got to resurrect 
on the third. And he's not resurrecting a physical body. And we can prove that by the scriptures. And that spirit that was in him was put in mankind on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost. And seven years later, in the Gentiles. And that I found out some pretty up in Thousand Islands. Carl shared with us about that seven years. And Peggy was looking up all the fruit trees, and all of them are almost seven years to, to achieve fruit. You understand? After you plant them. So in other words, the, the Jews, the, the scribes and Pharisees, they went to John's baptism, but they what? They wouldn't get in the water. They wouldn't get in the water. They did not partake of the burial. They were dead in sins, but they would not admit it. They would not get down in that water. So when the resurrection takes place, they can't come up with him. You see that? So they're cut off from Israel. They're cut off. And the Gentiles are grafted in. That's all written about in your book. But it's got to take seven years. And the witness is in the creation. And Kyle was sharing that with us up there. And, I, and it was like, ha, I could have had a V8, you know, one of, one of those aha moments. You know, I've been, I've been teaching that for I don't know how many years, but... I thought, well, seven, because seven steps in the tabernacle, seven, because of this, seven, that, seven seals on the scroll, seven. But now I really know why seven. Really brings it home to you, you know? And uh, that Holy Spirit is made available now, and when that's put in your heart and in your soul, then it's not like the old covenant. It's not like before. You're made a new creature. Brand new. Brand new. I'm, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to sit down. I want one more reference. First, uh, first Colossians, first chapter. I think 12 and 13. Flashes 1 and 12. Giving thanks unto the Father. Now, he's giving thanks <clears throat> unto the Father. Giving thanks unto the Father. Read. Which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the sons in light. Boy, there's a mouthful. Huh? We could stay busy for a half an hour on that. He's made us meet to be partakers or fit. He's made us fit by... By putting the Holy Spirit in you, he makes you fit to be a partaker of the sons. The sons and daughters who make up the body of Yahshua. This is big stuff. And I used to go into church and kneel down and bless myself. Genuflect. Didn't know what I was doing in the name of the Father. Didn't know what the name of the Father was. Name of the Son. Holy Spirit. Ah, didn't have a name. It was a bird. Didn't, we didn't know anything. And I wouldn't know anything now if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit giving me what I got. Read, please. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. Now, 
He delivered us. You didn't make a choice. He delivered you. Just like that baby. Right, Deb? Absolutely. Does that baby have any choice? I want out of here now. <laughs> it doesn't have any choice. Delivered. From darkness, from darkness or ignorance or a death-like state or hell or the grave. Mm -hmm. Call it what you want. Mm -hmm. Read. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And he translated your soul right into the kingdom of his, of his dear son. Huh? I thank you very much. All praise and honor be to Yahshua. And uh, I just wanted to see how, show you how, you see, before you can have a new covenant, you got to fulfill the things that were in the old covenant. You got to finish it. You got to bring it to an end. And then that new one can come to pass. So thank you very much for your patience. And, uh, all praise and honor be to Yahshua the Messiah. Thank you, Rick. For our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Deb Kometty. This is um, the covenants, the new covenant and the old covenant. This is something that we can't um, get over because <laughs> it's so critical to your spiritual health. Um, it's kind of like uh, being in remission from can <coughs> cancer and you just can't get over the deliverance and the health and the way you feel, you just can't get over. You just, like, I've seen people at the cancer center that um, are in remission, and they're like, I mean, they're skipping through the halls, and they're happy at the checkout, and have a nice day, miss, and they're, they're just so happy that they've been delivered. That's just an example of what we experience here. The deliverance that we have from the old ways of worship that we picked up, we didn't even have any business picking up because it wasn't given to us. It's kind of like picking up you know, a piece of chewed up gum off the floor and eating it and getting hepatitis. You didn't have any business going there. We did not get this covenant delivered to us as Gentile people. I want to go over to Romans, the seventh chapter, and I want to show you something that was shown to us down here by Dr. Kinley. Everything we know, Rick said, we wouldn't know if we hadn't come into this class. And it's true. Um, you know, we're not trying to worship Dr. Kinley, but it is true that he was given this information directly from Yahweh, and Yahweh told him to deliver it to the people, which he spent the rest of his life doing. And he was satisfied with what he had given the people because he told them, I've given you everything that Yahweh has given me to give you. So he was a faithful servant. And as you can see, if you tune in or if you sit under the sound of these lectures time and time again, you can see this is not something that we got from church, from we, what we got from our imagination, what we got from seminary school. You can actually see the difference of the, the truth and, like Ricky said, the veracity of this doctrine compared to tomorrow morning. You, you will see it. And the beauty of it is 
because we are listed on the website as a cult, you should know that. The beauty of this is, I've been in this class for 40 something years. Nobody once has ever asked me to have their children. Nobody's ever asked me for the deed to my mortgage. Nobody has ever beat up my children for disobedience. Nobody has ever done the basic tenets of a cult where you have one man and he wants all the women to servitude to them. They beat up the children. None of that has ever happened here. Yet and still, we are listed as a cult. And you should know that because if you tell somebody about class and they go Google you and they find it to be a cult, you should be ready. That just happened to me recently uh, with somebody's grandmother. And you know they pulled the person aside that I was trying to have come to class and said, you know that Debbie's in a cult. And so I barely, very simply said, well, you've been in my house, but there's no you know, blood of the lamb anywhere. Uh, me and John are pretty basic going to work people and paying the mortgage. I'm, I mean, you've been in my house. You know my children. Uh, I live in Lakeland. I mean, I'm not, you know, in some, you know, compound somewhere. So you should, you know, just weigh, weigh it out. But we are listed, you know, Dr. Kinley being the, the gang leader, we are listed as a cult. So weigh it out. Um, I think that's critical to you being able to, you know, we're devoted and we're dedicated to the truth. So you should know all the facets of what we're about so that you can make the decision and, and weigh this out. So if we go to Romans, the seventh chapter, we'll start there. Uh, this is Paul. And Paul uh, doesn't mince words. He's, he's right out in front. I think because Paul had such a history of being so, so um, severe against the Yashuans, and he was persecuting him, them, and he was killing them. And then all of a sudden, he has a conversion. He has a change of heart and mind. And now he's on a mission to get everybody to see this Yahshua the Messiah and see them, see Yahshua in the truth. So let's start reading, Scott, in 7 and 1. And this is in Romans. Romans 7 and 1. Mm -hmm. Know ye not, brethren, mm -hmm. for I speak to them that know the law. Okay, so can I just make a, a distinction here? You're reading over in Romans, and he is separating his brethren, he's saying, I speak to them that know the law. Now, quite frankly, yeah. if this is read tomorrow morning in church, that goes right over your head. What is that about? What law? The speed limit? What is that? What, what's the law? I speak to them. He's saying, brethren, moreover, brethren, I speak to them that know the law. He's talking to Israel because Israel was the one. Ricky just showed you. Israel is the one that had the 603 ordinances, and then he also told you that that included the Big Ten Commandments that everybody, everybody took upon themselves to obey, and also took upon themselves the guilt and the beatings and the curses when they didn't obey them. And you couldn't possibly obey them. It wasn't in you. It wasn't given to you. But anyway, Almost everybody up and down the road knows the Big Ten, right? Okay, go ahead. How that the law had dominion over a man as long as he liveth. The law had dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Okay, now remember what we're talking about. The law, he's speaking to those that know the law. So the law had dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Now this is important because people will pick this up and if you have divorced and remarried, they will blame you against this law, even though you're not Jewish. They will blame you against this law. Okay, so go ahead. For the woman which hath the husband is bound by the law to her husband. The so woman, okay, I'm sorry, Scott, I'm going to have you finish. So long as he liveth. The woman, she's taken a vow and she's bound to her husband as long as he liveth. Correct? Go ahead. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. If the husband has died, she's loosed from that marriage because he's dead. And what? 
So that if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. So if she leaves her husband or she uh, gets divorced from her husband and remarries, she's called an adulteress. Okay, go ahead. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. She's free from the law if her husband be dead. She's free from the law to... Go ahead. So that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another. Though she man. be married to another. Okay. Now, that is not applying or applicable to anybody tonight in this room that may have been married, divorced, and remarried. Doesn't apply. But what it does, what he is trying to show them here is something about. Ricky had it read. We'll go back to uh, Sam. Get Jeremiah, please. 31, 31. Ricky had it read that these people back here, this nation of Israel, was married unto Yahweh Elohim. I was a husband unto them. And they broke the covenant. They broke the vow. They broke the marriage agreement, the promise. Although I was a husband unto them. Okay, now this is going to be critical to understand where this whole thing is going. It's going to be critical for you to understand the Godhead because we're going to show you how Yahshua's death on the cross loosed this people, Israel, from this covenant because he died. And you're going to have to scratch your head if you don't see this that Yahweh Elohim, who married them back here, was also in this body of Yahshua the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So if you see the unity of the Godhead and you see Yahshua going to the cross, see, the husband has died and the wife, the nation of Israel, has been loosed from the agreement. And it's critical to see that end because it had no power. Now she was free to marry another. Okay. So is, uh, where are we? I know uh, I had Sam pull. Go ahead, Sam. You read what you got first. Okay. Behold, uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 and 31. Yep. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant mm -hmm. with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, saith Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So Yahweh... Elohim has it in the plan and the purpose of salvation to come in as a, in a physical body and end this way of worship back here, this old covenant, this Old Testament, which Rick was talking about. He has a plan to end that. Behold, the days come. I'm going to what? I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, a new covenant... So this one is going to vanish away. I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And he says, after those days. So you must know what are those days that this is coming along. Where is this in the program? Okay. After those days, saith Yahweh. Keep reading, Sam. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, saith which by covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. So that's what we're talking about. At this point, Israel as a nation is an adulterous woman. Okay? She followed after the golden calf, and she followed after Baal, and she followed after Moloch, and she followed after a whole bunch of gods. Okay? So she's showing that she is not going to be true to Yahweh Elohim. But Yahweh Elohim... He's got a plan and a, a pattern of salvation. So this is not just an unsuccessful event. There's a time that this is all going to come into, like Rick was talking about, a fruition on the day of Pentecost. That's why it, to talk about his mercy and to talk about his kindness and talk about his grace shows you just how long-suffering and incredible he can be with a nation called Israel. And then to think of the, Jew, the Gentiles, he's got them a plan for them, and they haven't even been involved in all this. 
and he's still thinking of them, he's still got them in the game, okay? But they're not involved in all this stuff right here. There wasn't Gentiles back here. And this is where the rubber meets the road, where Dr. Kinley broke this apart and showed us what was what. Right. And when you start to see, you get all the dust and all the dirt out of the way and you start to see the truth of the matter, it sets you free. Mm -hmm. From any of it that you're harboring, especially when Frank gives his testimony of the Catholic Church and people don't even realize how they're harboring guilt that a priest might have put on a little boy years ago and they carry it with them and they don't even realize it's with them. That stuff can be let go. You can be free. Yahshua, freedom, liberation, salvation. Okay, go back. Uh, now, Sam, do I want you or do I want Scott right now? Seventh chapter. Okay. I do want, okay, yes. Because Ricky read Jeremiah. I had, did I pull in the husband part again? Although I was a husband unto them? Yeah, that's, that's the husband. That's the point. I do. I will do what you say. I will be your wife. I will be your husband. And he proceeded to be a husband for the time they were in the wilderness. And he made a promise. And he kept his promise. And he brought him into Canaan land. Okay? So... Go back, Scott, to Romans, because now all this has come up to a head, and this is after, Romans is after the death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, and he's talking to a nation, and he's explaining what's transpired, and where you should fall in line now, where you should be after this day of Pentecost. Okay, so go ahead, Scott. Uh, Romans 7 and 4. Yes. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Yahshua. Okay, perfect. He's bringing it into the reality now. He's gone through all these steps to say, now, my brethren, my Israelite brethren, you are going to be what, Scott? You are also become dead to the law by the body of Yahshua. You're become dead to the law by the body of Yahshua. Keep going. That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto Yahweh. Wow. A mouthful. But remember, it's still all Israel at this point, right? You guys, you Israelites, my brethren, you guys that had the law, wherefore now, through the body of Yahshua the Messiah, through his death, you're going to be released from this and you're going to be married to another. Now, if Yahshua just raised the same old body, how's that work? It would not work. But Yahshua raised a quickening spirit. And that's how they're married to another when? On the day of Pentecost. Right? Okay, Sam, you get Acts 2 and 1. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, yes. did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Fruit unto death. We call this back here, we call this the law of sin and death. Because there was no possible way anybody was going to be righteous through it. Go ahead. But now... We are delivered from the law. We're delivered from the law. That being dead, wherein we were held, yes. we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. How is that possible? Sam, Acts 2 and 1. This is where it starts. And then, Scott, you get uh, over there in um, Colosh, or, uh, Galatians where it uh, happens for the uh, Gentiles uh, seven years later. Go ahead. Acts 2 and 1. See, he's saying that we're going to be this new creature in this new man. And when is that? And how is that? It's the day of Pentecost. It's A.D. 33 and then A.D. 40. Go ahead. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, 
When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Okay, one accord in one place. And you know what? They've even, Yahshua's even got them gathered in an upper room to show you a principle of being elevated or being up in the spirit. It's not that if you're in a high building, you're in the spirit, but it's a principle. They're in an upper room and they're all gathered together. And he's got them there for a reason. Now go ahead. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Yes. Like a rushing mighty wind. Now if you go back and you check your scriptures, you can even, we were reading in Ezekiel the 36th chapter. If you read Ezekiel the 37th chapter, it likens the winds coming from the four corners of the earth as that spirit. The winds come together, so a rushing mighty wind is significant as the spirit. See? Go ahead. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. It filled all the house where they were sitting. It filled the upper room, and it filled them each as men. Go ahead. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire. Yes. And it sat upon each of them. And it sat upon each of them. And you can see over here how they have depicted the cloven tongues as a fire. They're being baptized in the Holy Spirit and in fire. Go ahead. And there appeared unto them, uh, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. That should give us such a confidence and such a joy because it's not like you go to college and you get an associates and you're not you know you're not quite done and you got to get a bachelor's and you're not quite done and you got to get your masters and you're still not quite done to be filled with the education that the people look at because when you're out there I know this Dan from when we're you know at the hospital if you are a PhD you're God. You're everything. Because it took you so much to get there. Time, money, effort, diligence, patience, right? You're filled with the education of, of mankind, right? Yeah. But you aren't filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. That's right. Us little group down here in this little ugly building, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's the mercy of Yahshua. That's the beauty of his grace, to take a little group and to make them big, and to take a little tiny thing and to magnify it above all. These people were filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't have to go to seminary. They didn't have to keep going and working on something. From this point on, they're filled and they're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay, go ahead. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now we can go on and we can go on and we can go on about this Pentecost because these men, there's a change. And they go from hiding, as Ricky said, is there a change from crying to singing? Here's another change for you. Hiding to out in the streets, publicly declaring the death, the burial, the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah publicly. You know, they didn't just give you a ticket or spank you back there. You got yourself killed if they didn't like what you were doing. Remember Stephen? Yeah. Come on, man. They stoned you. If, I mean, these things were, they were really intense back there. These guys are out there knowing their lives could be knocked out in a minute. And they're out there 9 o'clock in the morning and they're publicly declaring the death, the burial, the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. They've gone from hiding to out there in the public. There's been a change. And each and every one of you that are a partaker of the Holy Spirit will have that same exact testimony. There's been a change. You are not the same person. Not to say, like Dr. Kinley said, I didn't like rice before the conversion, and I don't like rice tonight. That's not what we're talking about. But you will have a change where you will go from the creature subject to vanity to being a partaker of this newness of life that was talked about in the scripture. Now, just real quick, I don't have a watch, but I'm going to get down. Just real quick, I want to bring in 
us. I want to bring in the Gentiles. Seven years later, as Rick talked about, seven years later, that fruit of that Holy Spirit is going to be put out to the Gentiles. And they too now are going to be partakers of that Holy Spirit. See how we got it written over here? Here's the Jews' Pentecost. Seven years later, here's the Gentiles' Pentecost. And you know what? Nobody is yet and still in either Pentecost. Nobody's getting in water at this point. These guys, excuse me, they already had to get in the water. But at this point, nobody's getting in water to be baptized and to receive anything. It's all going to be spiritual. And you know how it's going to happen? By speaking. And that's why tonight or the next night or on YouTube... By being under the sound of the words of the true gospel, that's how you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. It's spirit bearing witness to spirit. It's not Debbie being so skillful and you being so attentive. None of that. It's spirit bearing witness to spirit. Go ahead. Galatians 4. Oh, I'm sorry. Not Galatians. It's Acts uh, 10. It's just talking about Peter. He's being sent now. Seven years have passed. That's a long time. And he's being sent over to the Gentiles' house. And he's going to witness to the Gentiles about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah according to the scriptures. And by faith... This Holy Spirit that we're talking about is going to fall on the nations. It's going to fall on the Gentiles. So that's what we're talking about. This new covenant, it involves everybody. And it was talked about way back here to Abraham, that as the, st the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven, he was going to be the father of many nations. And you know why Abraham was going to be the father and not Moses? Because Abraham is of faith. See, Moses is of that law. So Abraham, he believed Yahweh, right? Abraham, the promise was given to Abraham and he believed. Now you're seeing that come to fruition. You're seeing that come to pass on both nations. See, it's no longer just separated and just uh, to the Jews. It's to the Jews and to the Gentiles. So that's right. I just want to bring in the point of where that is, Scott. Um, Peter, mm, it may even be like 33, 34. 34. Yeah. Okay. Acts 10 and 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of the truth I perceive that Yahweh is no respecter of person. Oh my gosh. Apparently he was before. Of a truth I see now in the purpose and the plan, keep up. Of a truth, now Yahweh's no respecter of persons. It's going to be available to the Gentiles. And Peter didn't know that at first either. That's the whole vision with the sheep being let down. That's another day. Go ahead. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Yes. The word which Yahweh sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Yahshua the Messiah... Uh, he is Yahweh of all. Yep, go ahead. The word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee yep. after the baptism which John preached. Yep, so he's bringing this whole thing, he's bringing the whole thing up to present. Go ahead. How Yahweh anointed Yahshua of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit yep. and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for Yahweh was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. And it's important that you had to be an eyewitness, because these are the only ones that could go and preach to Gentiles and have that Holy Spirit fall on them. You could see that when Philip, he ran, and he ran down to his whole hometown, and I think it's Caesarea or somewhere like that, and he preached the gospel, and nothing happened. 
because he wasn't the eyewitness. It had to be the eyewitnesses. It had to be the disciples. So here's Peter, and he's preaching this gospel. Now, Sam, I don't know if I need you to edit down or jump down, but I just want the part... Yeah, 40, 40. Okay, 44. Go ahead. Well, Peter yet spoke these words. Peter is talking. Peter is speaking. He's not mixing up a bowl of uh, baptism water. He's not getting the bread ready. He's not... Peter is speaking while Peter yet spoke. These words, the Holy Spirit fell on all of them who heard the word. The Holy Spirit fell on them. Who? The Gentiles that heard the word. That's why these classes are set up tonight the way they are as a classroom. And we're doing the YouTube. Because as you sit and listen and somebody's speaking the truth about Yahshua's death, burial, resurrection... How he poured out his spirit on Jews and Gentiles. As they were speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on all of them. Go ahead. And they of the circumcision who believed were astonished. The Jews who were of the circumcision that were with Peter, they were astonished. This, had, this was never how it went down, ever. They were always the, the separated ones. They were always the ones that Yahweh dealt with exclusively. So they're astonished. Now here we are, the Holy Spirit is falling on people, and all that was is he's preaching the word. They're blown away. They don't have all those ordinances to go through. And here it is, the promise fulfilled with these Gentiles seven years later. Now, I don't know how much more. Do we need something more there? Same verse. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yep. As many came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, guys, we're the Gentiles. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like the Jews. See, and he's made one nation now. One nation, and we make up that bride. That's the covenant now. So you may ask yourself, well, what do I do now? I'll tell you this. What you don't do is try to keep any of this business over here. Right. See? Now, am I telling you, go out and cheat on your wife tonight. It's, all, it's okay. It's all good. I'm not telling you that. And Dr. Kinley said many, many times, we're not teaching you that down here. We're not teaching you that junk. That's your own headache. That's your own problem. What we are saying is that this law went out, and there's a new law, and something that Ricky had read, that he will pull you out of the power of darkness. So somebody that's pulled you out of the power of darkness, do you think in that same little package is there's, go cheat on your wife tonight? doesn't make sense. Just think about the things that you're, uh, you know, that little imp's putting in there. Oh, that's cool. And they did it. Oh, this is all gone. This is all done. They did it. Hands down, they went crazy. And Dr. Kinley, he had to do lecture after lecture saying, I'm not teaching you that junk. You want, you want to get all caught up in that mess? I'm not teaching you that down here. And don't say I am, because I'm not. I'm teaching the power of a resurrected soul in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And that's what we're still doing down here tonight. And I hope you got something out of that. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. For our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Greg Prestis from our Ethica New York class. Good evening, class. Uh, the gospel has been preached tonight, for sure. And um, it's just astounding. The, um, the simplicity the depths and the fact that 
that which we've heard tonight, this is the gospel that was preached 2,000 years ago or, or at the time of the Messiah. This is the gospel that Peter preached to those, to Cornelius and um, his house, A.D. 40-ish, almost 2,000 years ago. And half the world is carrying around a Bible and has no idea that this that we've heard tonight is what the Bible is about. And, you know, they call Greg Prestis, Gregory Prestis, whoever they called, but really we want Gregory Prestis to stay in his seat. <laughs> and we don't want to hear what Rick or Dr. Patrick Trevison thinks about anything or Debbie Cometti or Dr. Kinley or anybody. This is about Yahweh, Elohim, coming into the flesh as Yahshua the Messiah and accomplishing and his purpose and then revealing that purpose to everyone that believed him beginning at the day of Pentecost. And that is fundamentally unbelievable. And we're not saying that you need to come in and study hard and with your carnal natural intelligence and save yourself by memorizing scriptures, by coming to class every week. There's just so much. Um, and like I say, the job's been done. So uh, maybe, you know, what I want to try to do is just, just pick up a few more things and maybe put one or two more bricks on top, but on the foundation that's been laid and we don't want anything toppling. Because <laughs> it's so much and everything is connected and the things, it, you know, here's one thing. And I just can't allow myself to get pulled into any one thing because, but Daniel talks about the 2300 days. And you've got all sorts of, you know, I mean, there's no shortage of learned Christian literature in the world. And you have people smarter than us, well, much more educated, much more articulate. You have traditions of people studying these things over the centuries, writing about things that are in the Bible and what they believe it all means. And these are all things Dr. Kinley talks about in various lectures. Because we wouldn't, I wouldn't know one of these things without that. But just quick, so you have the world trying to figure out the 2300 days of Daniel. And they start 454 BC and I think it was Jehovah Witnesses came up in 1844 and they decided that was the end of the 2300 days and that's when the sanctuary would be cleansed. But then nothing happened, so they revised their opinions. But, see, Dr. Kinley comes in and says, A day with Yahweh is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. And these are things I've heard since I walked in the door, and only recently have been able to appreciate just a little of the, the, the depth and the profoundness of it. So, on this chart which you may not notice, but there's a 1,000 here. So, Yahshua died on the cross, right? On, and he's buried in Joseph's new tomb. Um, and that's a day, because... Oh, didn't it turn dark from the sixth to the ninth hour? Yes. See, it's got to be dark when he's dying. Why? Because Yahweh waited until the cool of day to cast Adam out of the garden. And there was a plague of stingy and black darkness here. And in the beginning of Moses' vision of the creation, the physical creation, not the beginning of creation creation, what does it start with? It starts with darkness. So you have 1,000. That's a day. That's the 1,000 
days or 1,000 years with the Messiah's death. Then he's buried in Joseph's new tomb on Saturday. That's the second day, 2,000. And then he resurrects early in the morning on the third day. So that's a 300th part of the day early in the morning. And so 1,000, 2,000, 300, that's the, that's the 2,300 days of Daniel that was shown to our founder in a vision. And there's no man in the world who would, has figured that out, and people don't believe it to this day. Now, you come over here. Darkness, that's 1,000. Buried in the waters, the earth is buried in the waters, that's the 2,000. And then what happens? The waters roll back, and the seed of vegetation comes forth, See, that's the early, that's like the resurrecting early in the morning, and then the rest of the third day, it comes into the fruition. See, so you have 2,300 days to the resurrection, and the seed of vegetation resurrects from the earth. Now, furthermore, Adam, where's he? He's still in the, and like I say, this is all from the founder. I wouldn't, couldn't even begin with this. But where's Adam? He's in Mother Earth. And Mother Earth was inundated in the waters. And when does Adam come forth? Doesn't come forth on the fourth day. That's the 1,000. Doesn't come forth on the second day. That's the 2,000. He comes forth. At the be now, the sixth day, there's a double operation, right? But he comes forth at the beginning or the 300th part of the day. So that's the 2,300 days there or resurrection. It's just death, burial, resurrection. It's just what's been preached. And we have, oh, Daniel, 2,300 days. We go into all this. And there's other historical ramifications of these things. I'm not saying there's not. But the power is in the simplicity and the repetition. And uh, never in a million years. I mean, this business about a second, the, the first day, second day, third day, after the first day, second day, third day, I caught that in a transcript. <laughs> I was like toast for a week, you know, I was like, never saw that in a million years. Now the children of Israel, they're shut up in their houses, right? And there's a plague of Stygian black darkness, and the death angel is coming over, and they had to put the blood of the lamb on the door, right? And then they come out in the night, and they come to the Red Sea, and then went early in the morning on the third day. See, Yahweh has them wait there. And it's not till early in the morning. See, Adam's going down in the cool of the day. It turns dark when he's dying. When he resurrects, it's early in the morning with the sun coming up. When they come out, it's early in the morning with the sun coming up. See, the sun, S-U-N in the sky, is created to reflect the sun of Yahweh. And his whole purpose, you know, we used to talk about correlations. Well, this correlates with that. This it's all correlated. It's just what Yahweh is able to show us, uh, what we're able to receive, really, and then what you can articulate, you know, I mean, uh, you know, generally our prayer, certainly my prayer, is just let me say something that's intelligible, because if you're not careful, you just start babbling. Or I do, and I know you know that. <laughs> All right, so... See, something so simple. See, this is Yahweh's purpose, and it's reflected in everything. And you're tired and exhausted at night. Sometimes we even say, dead on his feet, dead tired. Sometimes you don't even remember what your spouse tells you when you're, you know, you're like, well, I told you that when you came home from work. Oh, well, honey, I'm sorry. I was just, I was dead on my feet. Right? And you're buried and you want clean sheets, and you want, and don't we have flower motifs a lot of times? See, we're buried in Joseph's new tomb, or Gregory's new tomb, or whoever's new bed it happens to be. And then when you resurrect in the morning, not always early, <laughs> right? Don't you expect to be refreshed? Isn't that the beginning of a new day? And if you wake up in the morning feeling the same way, you felt at night, what's the next thing you do? Forever. Now, it used to be this, but that, nobody knows what that is anymore. Now it's this. Hey, Doc, 
Something's wrong with me. Right? Yeah. See, the, everything about Yahweh's purpose is reflected in the physical, and it's only we're the thing that gets in the way. And we've been deceived, we've been lied to, and it's according to Yahweh's purpose. And the whole thing, it just, see, how can I say that? How can we know that for sure? How can we understand that? Because he repeats and repeats and repeats. And if we're talking about Pentecost, what we've been talking about tonight, a new heart and a new spirit, well, why do you need one? See, because... Oh, it's so much. But the whole story is there in the children of Israel. And we pick them up down here in Egypt, but didn't they... Abraham came from up here, from the Ur of Chaldees, right? Wasn't he up here? Yes. And we give Yahweh credit for delivering them out, but we don't understand... He told Abraham that your seed will be strangers in a strange land and they'll be evilly treated. So it's Yahweh's purpose that they were slavery and bondage because it was his purpose to deliver them. And then those that he delivered, that which had been born in Egypt, the 605 thousand some odd soldiers, plus the women and children and youngsters, um, what happened to all of them? They didn't get into the promised land. Did they? No. Except for three of them, four of them if you count Joshua. So the whole purpose, see, is it coming down and it's going back. Now, Adam, he starts out I, I can't, I don't have the time to keep running back and forth over there. I wish, well, make myself a liar. <laughs> Happens all the time. There's so much information here. So, Yahweh forms Adam of the dust of the earth, breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and he's not alive at that point until the breath of life enters him, and he becomes a living soul. See, that's that first resurrection, physically. And then Yahweh plants, planted a garden, and he puts the man in the garden. Right? And he had to have something to eat, so the trees in the garden are in fruition. Right. And his ultimate job was to dress and to keep the garden, but Yahweh set the whole thing up. There wasn't anything for him to do at that point, and he didn't last long enough in there to have to do any work. So there's a, he was at a rest. So it starts at rest. And then in the garden, Yahweh puts him into a deep sleep and takes the woman, forms the woman from his flesh and bone, right? And presents the woman and says, uh, said, you know, he showed him all the animals, but no, none of the animals were meat. None of the animals were fit. And then we have the scripture that said, hath made us meet to be partakers. Yes. See, and wasn't Deb working with, we are the bride? Yes. Now, one man, one woman, one commandment, one God, one devil. That's the whole purpose in the garden. But, see, it was, now, when you have a tree, and you have the fruit on the tree... Do little apple trees sprout off on the tree and you go up, climb on the tree and cut off an apple tree and plant it in the ground? No, no what happens? The fruit's got to fall in order for it to bring forth fruit. Right. See, and it's just, uh, this is something Dennis heard Doc say like long, long time ago that he brought out one point. But you see how pretty that is? Yahweh, it's, Yahweh set that up on the third day. That's right. And then when he tells Adam to be fruitful and multiply, you know that it's in the purpose of Yahweh that Adam's got to come down off the tree. Adam's come, come down out of the garden. Right. And what caused him to come out of the garden? Now there's a, that's a, a multi-layered question. But, Ultimately, he, he disobeyed the commandment of Yahweh. 
But Adam was not deceived, and Paul picks that up. And the woman being deceived was in the transgression, and Adam, out of the love for his bride, partook of the tree, knowing it was going to kill him, in order to accompany her, and because Yahweh created him that way, it was Yahweh in Adam causing him to do that by the nature he had imbued within Adam. See, and so they're cast out of the garden into the darkness. Now, what does he do? Not, uh, now, instantaneously, they hear Yahweh, and what do they do? Hide. Hide. Now, they weren't hiding from him before. See, they were, con they were condemned instantly in their conscience. So this very clearly shows you there is the, a spiritual or the realm of what we call the soul oftentimes, or the heart and the mind, and there's the realm of the physical body. Now, Yahweh had told them, in the day that you will touch, you will surely die. Didn't, like we think, he said, well, if you touch, you will die. But we already covered Yahweh. This is Yahweh's purpose. And it's Yahweh is, we are Yahweh materialized. And it's Yahweh in us causing us to operate according to his purpose. And <clears throat> they die instantaneously in the conscience. And then Yahweh waits till the cool of the day and casts them out of that I, now, if, if somebody, if all you had to do was go out your backyard, pick some fruit, eat it, didn't have to work, no arguments in the house, you and your wife are in love and everything's cozy, isn't that a lot of us w would look for that? Mm -hmm. They had that. But when they disobeyed the commandment according to the purpose of Yahweh, they lost that. And this, just as Yahweh said, knew Israel was going into bondage and orchestrated it through the famines and everything, he knew that, he orchestrated, he knew that was going to happen. It's according to his purpose. But see how in the simplicity of it, it's showing you they were alive both physically and spiritually in the garden. They died spiritually instantaneously because there's no time in the spirit. But then Yahweh waits till the cool of the day because the physical is reflecting the spiritual. And so as the sun is going down, what happens at sundown? The earth becomes dark. And if you're out in the woods or if you're out on the lake fishing without a GPS and there's no moon and you're not a Stargazer, don't you want to get back to shore before it gets pitch black? Yes. Right? Yeah. So the earth is descending into darkness or nighttime. And what does he do? At the cool of the day, say, Adam, what's with the fig leaves? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was ashamed, or, uh, oh no, I was naked, right, and I hid, and I was ashamed because I was naked. Well, who told you were naked? Yeah. See, they are standing before Yahweh, they are in the judgment. Yeah. See, there's a judgment in the garden, only it's coming down. And if you want to understand something about going back, you just got to turn it around. And that's, his purpose comes down, and it goes back. It comes down, and it goes back. It comes down, and it comes back. Now, oh, the woman, she gave me the fruit. I ate it. And it was because of his love. And Yahweh purposed for him to do that. He purposed for mankind to be put unto subjection to the devil. Now, a lot of people... Oh, I don't, I don't believe the devil. It's like, that's okay. With Dr. Kinley one time, he says, Now, all right, if there's no devil, would you kindly explain what is going on down here? <laughs> <laughs> See, where did murder come from? There was no murder in the garden. Murder doesn't show up until Cain. But anyway, what does he do? Talks to the woman. Says, well, the serpent beguiled me. So first he gets to the bottom of the story. Mm -hmm. Then he talks to the serpent, which is um, 
that mystery of iniquity cast out of heaven the, into the chaosus of the earth. And then once the garden is there and he shows up and he beguiles the woman. And he tells the serpent, you know, curse it. He, doesn't he curse the serpent? Yes, yes. And says, on thy belly they sh thou shalt go and dust shalt thou eat. And he puts enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. Right, and he prophesies that thou shalt bruise her seed's heel, and he shall bruise thy head. Yes. Right, and then see that mystery of iniquity or that serpent. He's coming down through those four thousand years, and it says in Psalms that a day with Yahweh has a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. Yes. Covered that a bit, right? But then it also says, as a watch in the night. And it talks about, there shall be a day and a night that's known only unto Yahweh. Right? And we talked about how it turned dark here, and then it turned light, and then it turned dark. And you have a day, an extra day on Friday here that it was known only unto Yahweh. And so, Adam dies in his conscience. Eve, condemned in her conscience, they're cast out into the earth. Now, he had given Adam dominion over the earth, right? But um, now he curses the earth for the man's sake and says, In sorrow thou shalt till the ground um, until you return to the earth, because from dust thou was taken, dust thou shalt return. Tells the woman, In sorrow thou shalt have uh, be bearing children. See, he curses mankind with sorrow because of the disobedience, and that's the darkness. And these four first four dispensations, uh, a dispensation or a millennium is a, a thousand years. And for from when they come out of the garden, the Adamic dispensation, the Noahic dispensation, Melchizedek promise, the Abrahamic promise the Mosaic Covenant or the Old Testament. See, those are 4,000 years where mankind is in darkness. It's the night. It's, these are the four watches in the night. This is the day, a, a day and a night that's known only unto Yahweh. Now, see, Adam lost his dominion. He lost his first estate, he lost the heavenly condition, and he was cast in the darkness. So Abraham, he falls asleep, and lo, a horror of darkness falls upon him. And Yahweh tells him, thy seed shall be strangers in a strange land. Now see, we go through the self-same thing. We're born, now bouncing little baby boy, or girl, as the case may be, and parents are so happy. You know, everybody... It's like bliss. Like they send out pictures, right? Oh, congratulations. In some cases, you know, when things are going right. But then they hit teen, you know, by the time they're teenagers, a lot of time rebelling against the parents, angry. Um, see, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of Yahweh. We all are condemned in our conscience, just like Adam was. We're walking in not just the physical darkness, but we don't know Yahweh. We don't have the light of understanding in our minds. And we are, that's what we call the state of being carnally minded. We can only see things physically. That's what happened to Adam and Eve when they were cast out of the garden. They became carnally minded. We're so concerned with the world, the world, and what we can get out of the world, and what we need in the world, and what the world's doing to us, and the world, the world, the world. It blocks us from knowing and seeing and seeking Yahweh. And, um, oh, give me um, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Seven minutes, right? Yeah. 1 
1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of Elohim, for they are foolishness unto him. Now, we don't expect... You know, uh, it's another thing Dr. Kinley says quite often, is unless the Spirit reveals this to you, and it's through the preaching of the Gospel that Yahweh has purpose to save them that believe. And if you believe, He puts that Spirit of belief in your heart, then we resurrect out of that death. But um, unless that happens, there's nothing you can do but say this is wrong. Because it has to contradict the things that were, are taught in the world. And another way to talk about the new covenant and the new heart and the new spirit and, uh, is, is when he tells Nicodemus um, that you must be born again. That which is born of the earth is earthly. That which is born of the heaven is heavenly. Born of the spirit is heavenly. Now, go ahead, Marie. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. See, these things are spiritually discerned. These things, somebody can tell you, it says in Habakkuk, I will work a work in your day, which you will not believe, even though somebody tells you. And Dr. Kinley's case, he told them for 45 years. And you have people not believing it. Okay? Now, um, so, uh, another thing came up tonight that we don't have time to work with, but um, right after Deb stopped in Acts, the 10th chapter, is the, one of the, the key verses that have people convinced that you need to get into water in order to join a Christian church. Paul, after they've already received the Holy Spirit, Peter says, can any man forbid them water? But then you go to Acts 11.14 when he's retelling the whole thing to his cronies, to the, right, the other Jews who have the Holy Spirit. And he says, then I remembered, oh my goodness, how the Messiah told us that you know, we would be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. But here's something else that I didn't fully appreciate or didn't appreciate more than not saying I appreciate it fully <laughs> until recently is you see how see they killed Yahshua but that was they didn't stop with him when all his followers showed up wasn't there a persecution yeah. didn't the, both the Romans and the Jew wasn't Paul a Jew and he was out there with letters of authority killing the people that had received the Holy Spirit who were opposing the teachings of the Messiah, the teachings of the Holy Spirit. Now, Ricky, you know the history better than I do, but that persecution lasted for quite a while. And they were still being persecuted when, uh, was it Constantine? Who was the one that had the epiphany and made Christianity the... There was still some uh, of that going on, yes. So, another way to look at that, which I didn't realize, because, you know, I used to think, well, the Christians have the Bible, Catholics have the Bible, so they've got some stuff right. You know, I mean, there's, all you got to do is read out of the Bible and you've got truth. But going to church, tithing, confession, communion, they weren't doing that. You read the Bible and you think they were, but they weren't doing any of that. See, he fulfilled all carnal ordinances. There no going to Jerusalem to worship, passing the cup, all of those things. See, they killed everybody that understood the true gospel. And when things quieted down, they fabricated... The Roman Catholic Church was the first, quote, Christian church. And they fabricated and all their doctrine and patterned it after a mishmash of things they took from the Messiah with the, the Hebrew religion. 
ordinances, priesthood, daily, sir. Oh, the whole thing is just a rehash of this physical, earthly religion which the Messiah fulfilled, finished, and ended. And the world has been, Western civilization, Christ, Catholicism and Christianity, yeah, I gotta wrap this up, um, has been the primary influence in Christian civilization since like 400 AD. And that's the same thing as him putting Israel in the bondage. See, all of mankind been subjected to this satanic doctrine that we call, it's a tough pill to swallow, but we call it Christianity. And the whole thing was about his bride and him putting his spirit in his bride. And the whole thing is there in Revelation, the 12th chapter, which we don't have time to get. Right? I'm done, right? That was the first bell. That was the first bell. First bell. You got five. I got five? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Get Revelation, 12th chapter. See, that's grace. <laughs> Which is unmerited favor. Uh, yeah, one, I think. Revelation 12 and 1. Now, see, we didn't know. The world tonight doesn't know that all John is doing on the island of Patmos is confirming everything that's in the law and in the prophets and that happened with Moses and the Messiah and the whole rest of it. But he's doing it with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And... It's been covered tonight. Uh, Ezekiel, new heart, new spirit. Jeremiah, new covenant. Deb over there in Romans 7. The woman. We, we worked it with Adam and Eve. Man and woman. Now, I'll read this because I'm not going to get more than this five minutes. I'm, I'm lucky to get that. 12 and 1. <laughs> and there appeared a great wonder in heaven. Now, see, John's in the spirit. He sees a great wonder in heaven, but he's looking back. He's seeing the same vision, see, that Moses saw. And Dr. Kinley saw the same vision, and he saw John and Moses. And the Messiah showed that same thing to Peter, James, and John. And there's Moses and John up there in that vision. And it's just one vision, the day of eternity. Read. A woman clothed with the sun. Now see, the woman was clothed in the sun. And if you look at these charts... He's got a picture uh, that John is painting here, there on the day of Pentecost. See, and read. And the moon under her feet. See, the moon, the law and the prophets, it's not out of the picture, it's under her feet. And Paul, uh, you read it at Acts 24, Acts 26, Acts 28. All he did was go through the law and the prophets and show how that the Messiah, all the Messiah was doing was fulfilling and realizing those things that were in the law and in the prophets. See, and that's what we're doing. And that's what Peter did. And that's what the gospel is. Now the moon is under her feet. Read. And upon her head a crown of twelve stars. See, twelve stars. Weren't there twelve tribes of Israel? Twelve princes? See, this is Israel. Spiritual Israel, our new Jerusalem. The bride. And you could go work that out. Now it says she's clothed in the sun. Now, way back, see, in the garden... The woman was in the man. The woman, uh, and he put the man in the garden with the woman inside of him. So the woman, see, is clothed in the sun. So the end, see, is declared from the beginning. That's Isaiah 46 and 9. And now, uh, read. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth. Okay, um, skip a verse. Oh, no, go, go ahead. And there appeared another wonder. See, she's pregnant. She's going to have children. And didn't it say... Bring forth fruit. Oh, see, it's all just the same thing. It's all tied so together. Read. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, okay, skip, skip him. I want where it was granted unto her. See, did, did, wasn't there two wonders up here? There was the, the woman, the Adam and Eve, and then there was the serpent. So John's looking back into heaven. He sees the woman clothed in the sun. And then he sees another wonder, which is that serpent, or that mystery of iniquity. And they're both coming down. Oh, go ahead, read. Um, it is, I want it was granted unto her to be arrayed. 
in fine linen. Isn't it in there? All right. We'll let that go. Um, but it is in there. And that, uh, no, no. Uh, he, it's, in, it's in like 19 or 21. We don't have time for it. But um, 45 seconds. So she's clothed in the sun. That's bright and shiny, right? And then all through the law and the prophets, the priesthood, see, they're clothed in white linen, clean and white. And it says there that it was granted on, to the woman to be clothed in the white linen, which is the righteousness of the sons. Now, Ab uh, Paul, in, oh, I think it's Galatians 5, talks about how Yahweh preached the gospel in Abraham before the law. And what was the gospel? See, he said, Abraham believed Yahweh, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. See, she believed Yahweh, and it was granted unto her to be arrayed in the wine linen, white linen. And we are clothed in the sun. We are clothed in righteousness by grace through the faith of Abraham in the gospel. I hope that made some sense. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. You're welcome. Is this mine? Yep. Phew. <laughs> takes my breath away <laughs> when I hear all this is just so beautiful um, I'd like to thank you all for coming to welcome you all back we're here every Wednesday at 730 every Saturday at 7 o'clock and if we could all rise to be dismissed I'll be reading the doxology as it is in the last two verses of Jude in the Holy Name Bible now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say in unity, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.